Amen. So take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Where's Tess? Tess, you have the clicker? Would you give me a click? Thank you. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. If you, if you haven't been here in a while or this is your first time here, we've been going through the book of Hebrews. We're in chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Hebrews 10, starting in verse 19, we'll read through verse 25. So follow along with me in whatever version you have. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19, it says this, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, Verse 22, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So the writer here is addressing them as believers who are walking in this new covenant that the writer has been talking about for so many chapters. He's talking about this new covenant and he's addressing them as believers and they have claimed their victory in eternal forgiveness, okay? So verses 19 through 21 are really a summary of the past chapters. He's saying to them, dear brothers and sisters, all right, so dear brothers and sisters, since the blood of Jesus, our great high priest, has torn the veil of the separation from the holy of holies, this is what you need to do. And he tells us in verses 22, 23, and 24. So he says, since all this has happened, since Jesus has, has bridged the gap between a holy God and sinful man by, the de- by his death on the cross and by his resurrection, since the veil has been torn of this separation of this holy of holies, since that has happened by the blood of Jesus, then here's what I want you to do. And this really is the first time in almost the entire book so far of Hebrews where we have some kind of a prescription of what to do. It's kind of nice because you you read it and you go, ha, he tells us exactly what we need to do, all right? This is what he says. He says, since this has happened, Because this has happened, and remember for them, the Hebrews who are reading this for the first time, the book's written sometime before 70 AD, probably um, maybe 20 years after the death and the resurrection and ascension of Christ, maybe a 20-year period there, maybe 25, not for sure, but let's say 20 years. And many of the 500 witnesses who had seen Jesus in his resurrected body were even possibly even in this congregation hearing this or had told a friend about, hey, we saw the resurrection of Christ. At this point, even some of the apostles are still alive and can verify as to what Jesus did, this dying on the cross and this, uh, this resurrecting from the dead, all right? They could even testify. And so the, the readers of this are hearing this and he's saying, since this has happened and then for us, It's a a historical event that has more weight behind it and more evidence than anything of ancient history is the idea that Jesus lived and died and resurrected and ascended. We have more evidence for the fact of that, the historicity of that, than we do for for even the life of George Washington to say he's our first president. There's more evidence of, of Jesus Christ and his life and death So since this has happened, so I'm here to say today, since this has happened, since this historical event 2,000 years ago happened, this is what we're to do. And this is what the writer declares. He says, because of this, number one, let us draw near. Let us draw near. Number two, let us hold fast. And then number three, let us consider. So starting with number one is let us draw near. This idea of drawing near. Let us go right in, verse 22. He says, because all this has happened, because of Jesus, let us draw near 
with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So let us draw near with a sincere heart, he says. To draw near is to come towards, come close to something, to draw close to something. And the word sincere here means genuine, means without superficiality, means without hypocrisy or without ulterior motive. This idea of sincere, to be sincere is to be honest and real without uh, a hypocritical disposition. So he says, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance or with full assurance. This full assurance that we can draw near because of Jesus and everything that he did, we can draw near with full assurance, sincere assurance. Assurance is not, it's not a, a hoping. When you're sure about something, it's, you're not hoping, you are sure about it. It's surety, it's, it's complete trust in. 1 John 5, 13 says, I write these things so that you can know that you have eternal life. Think of being able to know, being sure of something, not hope that you have eternal life, but literally, the apostle John says, I write these things that we could even say the gospel. We could even say the Bible was written so that we can know that we have eternal life, that we don't have to hope for eternal life. So this is what the writer's saying here. It's not, it's not I hope so. It's not this idea of luck. It is knowing. It's having assurance of. So what does it look like to not be sure of something? To not be sure of something, to wonder, right? To not have full assurance. Well, we're not guaranteed tomorrow, are we? No, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not assured of it. We think so, but talk to the person that is gonna die today. And they said, I didn't know it was coming. I didn't know it was coming. None of us knows, right? Only God knows. I'm not assured of a paycheck. I hope I'll get a paycheck. I hope I get paid. I'm planning on it, but I'm not guaranteed it, right? I'm not even sure that the last 30 years of putting money into the social security system is gonna be there 20 years from now when I'm ready to get my due pay for it. I'm not even sure of that. I hope it's gonna be there, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure that the stock market won't crash and any money that I put in retirement, a 401k or anything else, isn't just gonna dissolve and disappear. I'm not sure. I, I, I hope. But this verse is saying that we are to draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Verses 19 and 21. Since we have confidence to enter the holy place, right? We have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, not by us, but by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, because of that, we can draw near to God. God is declaring because Jesus has died and resurrected, which tore the veil in two, opening the path for all believers, we can come right in towards God, come right in with genuine, undoubting heart. We can have a genuine, undoubting heart, our heart, our mind, our will, our emotions, our desires. We can come in with, without any doubting, with complete assurance and faith. What is faith? It's trust. With complete trust, we don't have to wonder. We get to go right in. We can draw near to God. We come in because... Why? He says, because our hearts have been sprinkled clean with the blood of Jesus. Our bodies have been washed by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus doesn't make our, our, our lives, doesn't, doesn't make us dark red with stains of blood. That's not what the blood of Jesus does. The blood of Jesus washes us white as snow. Interesting. The blood of Jesus sprinkled on us washes us white as snow. Isaiah 1.18 says, come now. And let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are as scarlet, our sins as scarlet, crimson, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. So our hearts are sprinkled clean by the precious blood of Jesus, sprinkled from an evil conscience is what Hebrew says here. By the blood of Jesus, our old self, the one that was not sprinkled clean, that was opposed to God, 
a conscience that was covered with evil and sin and hatred towards God, a heart that had a proclivity to sin, a heart that that was in complete opposition of God, a heart that had an appetite to sin, a heart that could not be trusted. But now, because of Christ, our hearts are clean and washed. They're new, which does what? Allows us who are in Christ to draw near to God. Because we're in Christ, we can draw near to God because we have our hearts washed clean with the blood of Jesus. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God because this has happened. Because this has happened, draw near to God and guess what? God will respond in drawing near to you is the plea of the scripture. Turn with me to Romans chapter eight. So what is the posture of, of someone who can draw near to God. What is their posture? Romans chapter eight. What's the posture of someone who can draw near to God with with full assurance of faith? Romans chapter eight, look at verses 15, 16, and 17. We're just gonna slowly go through this. And I want you to get the picture. I'm hopefully gonna be able to paint the picture for you in our imagination to picture what this must be like, what the writer, what Paul is saying here in the book of Romans when it comes to what is our posture as we get to enter this this throne of God, okay? Listen to what it says here in chapter eight of Romans, verses 15, 16, and 17. He says, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and heirs uh, and fellow heirs with Christ, indeed, if we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So get this picture with me first. Let's start out verse 15. It says, uh, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery leading to fear. The Bible says that perfect love casts out fear. It says that you did not receive a a spirit of timidity or spirit of fear, but we've received a spirit of power. So he says here, he says, you have not received a spirit of slavery to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption. Have you ever known an orphan? Do you know an orphan? Have you ever met an orphan? Maybe you have adopted somebody. Maybe you've been on a mission trip and you've met some orphans. Do you think orphans are afraid of anything? You think they're scared? Yes, they are. They're very scared. They have fear. An orphan has fear. What does an orphan have fear of? Being abandoned, being loved, being that they would may never be loved. Imagine the fear of an orphan. So what does the scripture say here? He says, you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again as an orphan, but you have received a spirit of adoption, spirit of adoption as sons and daughters that you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters, which we get to cry out the word Abba, which is Dada or Daddy. We get to cry out to this king on his throne, Daddy, right? Because we have the spirit of adoption as sons, which we cry out Abba, Father. So this is a new life. Imagine this, that we are declared adopted sons and daughters of God. That's awesome. He even says here, he says the spirit himself, the Holy Spirit himself, bears witness with our own spirit inside of us that we are children of God. There's this bearing, there's this testifying to say, you are a child of God. You're a child of God. Now we would, we would walk away from this going, that is fantastic. I am a child of God. I've been adopted. There's no reason for me to be afraid anymore, have any kind of fear of abandonment or fear of being an orphan out there on my own. No, I've been adopted by God. And we would say, that is good enough for me. But look what 17 says. Paul doesn't stop there. God doesn't stop there. The scripture doesn't stop there. It says, and if you're children, which you are, because the spirit bears witness with our spirit that you have been adopted, sons and daughters can't be forsaken anymore. He says, and if children, well, then heirs. Well, what's an heir? Someone is an heir to an inheritance or an heir to the throne, right? He says, and if children, heirs also. Heirs of what? Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Get this picture here. Can you imagine God? I picture God sitting on a throne, and I know God is spirit, but I picture him 
on this huge throne with this huge chair, you know, the huge chair the, from, from the, the kingdom days, right? This big ornate chair and God sitting up on maybe 12, 15 steps high up on this throne. And then Jesus, we've learned that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And God is on this throne sitting there, has every right to pass judgment. And he says here, but you are children, you've been adopted. And so we get to come through the gates and we walk through the gates of the city. And we would even say, oh man, at least I made it through the gates. I've made it into the city. This is fantastic. But God doesn't stop there. He says, no, 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 come into my throne room. So I picture this huge cathedral with God sitting on these steps high up and standing way at the back of the door. And, and as a child, man, I just might creep in and come into that back door and slide in and just sit in that back seat. But that's not what God says. God says, no, 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 no. You're my adopted son and daughter. You don't sit way back there. Come here, come forward. And what would I do or what would you do? I would probably have my, my head kind of bowed as I'm inching towards this throne going like, man, I'm not worthy of this. And inching and, and, and Jesus sitting there saying, no, no, come, son, come, come. And then coming to the bottom of that altar, 12, 15 steps high, standing on that bottom step and saying, this is good enough for me. Thank you. I can't even believe I'm in your presence here. And Jesus doesn't stop there. Jesus says, no, 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 walk up the steps. Come up the steps. You are my fellow heir and puts his arm around us. God sitting on his throne and Jesus sitting right next to him and stands up and puts his arm around you and me and says, no, you're a co-heir. You're my fellow heir. We're heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Can you imagine that scene? That's the posture that we can take when we have full assurance of our faith because of the blood of Jesus, because of what he's done. Imagine that, that we're sitting there, standing there next to Jesus as his co-heir. He wraps his arm around us where he could have said, hey, just stay right there. I mean, this, these steps here are holy ground. Don't come any further. But no, he says, no, no, you've been adopted. Come on up, you're my fellow heir. That's the posture. What a picture, what a remarkable scene of what, it looks like to be able to draw near to God. And that's what he says, draw near to God because this has all happened. And then secondly, he says, let us hold fast. Let us hold fast. Let us hold tightly. Since the blood of Jesus, our great high priest, has torn the veil of separation from the Holy of Holies, verse 23 says, let us hold fast. Look in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of, of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. One translation says verse 23 this way, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. So this does not mean that we're to hold tightly to our faith in such a way that it's only for us. That's not what it's saying. It's not hold tightly, right? Hold fast to your faith. Don't let go of it. Maybe don't even let anybody see it. Hold it tightly because you don't want to lose it. That's not what he's saying. He's saying hold tightly. So it doesn't mean to hold tightly in such a way as if to squeeze it to death for ourself only. There are those people whom you and I have met who have said, my faith is personal to me. My faith is my own. It's personal to me, right? A guy named Andrew White, he's seeking uh, the Democratic Party's nomination to be the governor of Texas. He affirms the party's position in favor of legal abortion and same-sex marriage. And he also is an elder at Christ the King Presbyterian Church, which is a PCA church. It's the conservative side of the Presbyterian denomination. And the PCA church holds to a biblical standard when it comes to abortion and the definition of biblical marriage. And this is what Andrew White said when he was quoted by World Magazine. He says, my personal faith is personal to me, but I will not let it interfere with how I govern. Holding fast, holding tightly to one's faith does not mean my personal faith is my personal faith and it's personal to me and it doesn't affect other areas of my life. That's not what it means to hold tightly to our faith. A born again believer is gonna share their faith. Man, is gonna share the best news ever. This is what we're gonna hold fast to because it's our hope, but we're gonna share it with everybody. We're gonna scream it from the rooftop. So what it does mean is that believers are to hold tightly to their hope. We hold tightly to the hope that is in Christ. 
when maybe life seems hopeless, when a storm comes and wavering might seem inevitable in our lives. We hold tightly to our hope. We hold tightly to our hope. How can one be sure? Well, the rest of verse 23 says this. Why? Because for he who promised is faithful. He, God, can be trusted to keep his promise. That's why. That's why I can hold tightly. And that's how I can be sure, because God's faithful. He can be trusted. Remember to whom the writer of Hebrews is speaking. He's speaking to wavering Jewish Christians. Wavering Jewish Christians who were facing or about to face extreme persecution and persecution unlike you and I are gonna probably ever experience. People in the Middle East are experiencing it. But this kind of persecution that this Jewish audience, Jewish Christian audience that that, uh, the writer of Hebrews is speaking to, remember it's right around 65 to 70 AD, maybe 60 AD that this is written. And then the temple is destroyed in 70 AD. And you have you have Emperor Nero. Emperor Nero is, in, is the Roman emperor at the time, and a big fire happens in Rome, and what does he do? He begins to blame the Christians, and he begins to persecute Christians. Major persecution. We're talking to the degree of where, where, where Emperor Nero would, would even put oil. He would dip oil or pour oil over someone who would not recant their faith in Christ. They would, he would give them three chances, recant, and say that you do not believe in Jesus, and call me Lord. And the born-again believer who is who has witnessed the resurrected Christ said, I cannot, I cannot. And so pour oil over them and for sport, sit on his balcony at night and pour oil over Christians and light them on fire as they just roamed the the front yard, the lawn until they just died. Taking ropes and putting it on each limb and then tying it to an animal and having the animal just split the body apart. Cutting animals right down the gut, a big animal, and then stuffing a person in that, and then sewing it back up just, to, just for humiliation, having them crucified, doing anything that he wanted to do as for sport. This is, this is, these are the people that are reading this. So when, when the writer says, man, hang on to your hope, because all this has happened, Jesus has done this, hold on to your hope, because I know it's gonna, be, it's gonna seem hopeless to you. I know that your life is gonna, is, is gonna be tough for you. You're gonna face persecution. Many of the people who heard this letter read for the first time died a martyr's death. They died that kind of death. And so the writer's saying, hold on to your hope. Hold tightly to your hope. Hold tightly to your hope. He's saying, hold tightly because Christ has done it. Hang in there, even in the midst of great trial, even in the midst of great persecution. Why? Because God has promised you the hope. And he's somebody that we can trust. So no matter what you're going through, no matter the great trials that you're in now or that are coming your way, hold tightly to your hope in Christ. When you feel like you can't go another day, you feel like you can't even do another day at work, hold tightly to your hope in Christ. When you feel like your finances are just gonna crumble around you, hold tightly your hope in Christ. When you feel like you just can't make it another moment in your marriage, hold tightly to your hope in Christ. And when you feel like giving up on life, you feel like giving up on your family, you feel like giving up on your future dreams, you feel like the addiction is just gonna crush you, the scripture is saying, hold tightly to your hope in Christ. Hold tightly. 1 Peter 5, 7 and 10 says this, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Because he cares for you. We cast all our anxiety on God. Why? Because he cares for us. Verse 10 says this, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Romans 8, 24 and 25 says, for in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Titus 1, 2 says, in the hope of eternal life. In the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ago. Romans 8, 35 through 39, you've probably heard this passage. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? 
Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing, nothing in this world, not the president, not world government, nothing, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's our hope. We hold fast because the blood of Jesus, our great high priest, has torn the veil, the separation from the Holy of Holies. So we hold tightly to that. We hold fast to that. And then finally, number three is, he says, let us consider, verse 24 and 25. Let us consider. This idea of consider is let us think of ways. Let us consider this, okay? Let us consider this, verse 24 and 25. So he says, let us draw near. Let us hold fast. And then he says, let us consider. In verse 24 and 25, he says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near, because Christ has paved an unhindered way for us into the presence of God, let us all motivate one another to love and good deeds. Let us motivate each other to love and good deeds because of what Jesus has done. Let us do this by continually meeting together as the community of the believers. We motivate one another. We encourage one another. And let us do this by continually meeting together as followers of Christ, as the community of believers. And then let us continually encourage one another because the end is drawing near. Let us consider, let us think of ways to be the church in one another's lives is what this passage is saying. Let us think of ways that we can be the church in each other's lives. I'm going to read the passages in Acts chapter 2 and chapter 4. And I'm going to read them in a way that applies to us. So this is the scripture, but I'm going to read it in a way that applies to us. So this is, this is the church, all right? This is a picture of the church. Let us be believers who devote themselves to the teaching of the word and to genuine fellowship and to sharing of meals, which includes the Lord's Supper, and to prayer, and to continually meet together in one place, share everything that we have with one another, even selling our property and possessions and sharing the money with those who have need, worshiping together each day, meeting in homes, sharing meals with great joy and generosity. Let us be united in heart and mind and trusting that what we own is not our own, but sharing everything that we have, all of us testifying to the power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's great blessing will be upon us. This is the description of the the church in the book of Acts. This is the picture. Is this a picture of us? Is this a picture of us? Is this, is this a picture of the anchor? The writer of Hebrews is saying to believers, they are to think of ways to truly be the church. Think of ways. Think of ways that we can be the church. If we are truly acting as the church, the body of Christ, we will do what? We will stimulate one another to love and good deeds. We will do that. So first, we love one another first, the scripture says. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of the faith, Galatians chapter six, First John three. We know that we have passed out of death into life because what? Because we love the brethren. We love brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, a new, command and I give to, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another. Do others know, do others know when they see my life, do they know that I agape you? Do they know that I love you? Do they know that? Do you know that I agape you? Or is it hidden? Do I not show it? Do I not have any love for one another in here? Do you not have any love for me or one another in here? Do we show this love? This is the, the earmark of a follower of Christ, that we love one another first. This is acting as the church. This is sharing stuff with one another. This is inviting each other into 
uh, one another's lives. This is what it is. This is the picture of the church. And then we love others as you love yourself. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second, right? We, we love each other, but then we love all people. Luke chapter 10 says this, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, puts Jesus to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, well, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, well, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers. And they stripped him and they beat him and they went away leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to that place, saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged up his wounds and pouring oil and wine on, uh, oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and he brought him into the inn to take care of him. And on the next day, he took out two denarii and he gave it to the innkeeper and he said, take care of him. Whatever you spend, when I return, I'll repay you. Which of these, Jesus says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. And then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. This is love. This is the love for others. These are our neighbors. The Samaritan, the guy that was a half-breed Jew, that's hated by Jews, goes to, they say, is probably a Jew and takes care of him where the priest passes right by him. The Levi, who's a Jew, passes right by him, but this half-breed Jew that's hated by Jews goes and takes care of him. I recently heard a gentleman who was running for city council recently. He's a believer, and I heard him uh, talking about being raked over the coals by the local media because he was a believer and the local politicians because of his Christian faith. And he said to the interviewer, he said, he said, why are you so threatened by my faith? Why are you so threatened by my faith? Why am I being judged for what I believe in a city that claims to be 85% Christian, in a city that would say they believe in the Bible and believe in Jesus? Why am I being so judged for my faith? He says, at the heart of what I believe is love. My faith tells me to love my neighbor as myself why is this so strongly upsetting so many people? Interesting, is it not? Isn't that Christianity? Isn't Christianity about love? It's about God's love for us, and it's about our love for him and for others. It doesn't make sense, does it? A, a, a city that says they believe in Jesus and says that they believe the Bible, and you say, well, so do I, and I believe that, that my God tells me that I am to love my neighbor as myself, what is wrong with that? Why are you all of a sudden calling me a bigot and, and calling me judgmental? Why? Are, why? When, when Christianity is summed up in loving God and loving others, isn't it? And the writer continues this in Hebrews. He says, let us consider, let us think of ways to not forsake our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but we encourage one another. We cannot encourage one another if this is what the scripture is telling us to do, we cannot encourage one another from afar. Can't do it from a distance. Very difficult to, I mean, yeah, you can write a text or uh, maybe send a, uh, an encouragement card, but not gonna be that encouraging, right? Can't really encourage one another from afar. It takes being in close proximity to one another. The very indication is saying that you need to be together. This is community. This is the church at its best is when we can not forsake assembling together, but we say, man, I can't wait to be together because we get to encourage one another into love and good deeds. I know you and you know me. We really know each other in this kind of a community. We know each other at our best. We know and rejoice in each other's successes. We rejoice with those who are rejoicing. We get excited when our brother or sister gets a new job or gets a promotion at work, or gets engaged, or gets pregnant, or has a new baby, or moves into a new house, or wins the lottery. There is no jealous or envy 
When we are living in community with one another, loving one another, caring about one another, there is no jealousy or envy when someone else succeeds or when someone else has something, when someone else is promoted in some way. We rejoice with those who rejoice. That's a picture of the church, that we know each other at our best, and then we know each other at our worst. We suffer with those who are suffering. We mourn with those who mourn. We suffer alongside those who lose their job or have a reduction in salary or those who are struggling in marriage or those who lose a child or those who lose their home. We mourn with those who mourn. We suffer with those who suffer. We do not say they made their own bed, let them lie in it. That is not the church. That is not the Christian community. That is not loving one another at their worst. We don't say, well, hey, they had it coming. They knew better. No, we love people at their worst. We help, we comfort, and we encourage one another. This, my friends, is a picture of the church. Is it not? This is a picture of the church. This is why we do not neglect, literally, the scripture says, stop neglecting. We do not neglect meeting together. So are we going to settle for anything less than being a a sincere community of believers? Are we going to do that? Are we going to settle in here? Are you going to settle for anything less? If so, then why are you even here today? Why why did we even come here today if we're going to settle for anything less than what the Bible says the church should be? Why even go to an MC? Why even call each other brother or sister in Christ? If we can't truly lean on one another, then what are we even doing here? How dare we even call ourselves a church? How dare we even say that we are in community? Let's just go back to the big building and go in through the back door of the sanctuary on Sunday. Let's just go sit in the back pew. Let's just come in late and let's just leave early let's just think to ourselves, I went to church today. God, aren't you proud of me? So in conclusion, this is what I'll, I'll say it again. I'll repeat. He says, dear brothers and sisters, this is what he's saying to us. I'm saying it. Dear brother and sister, since the blood of Jesus, our great high priest, has torn the veil of separation from the, from the holy of holies, since he has done this, let us draw near to God with full assurance of our faith, because we've been washed and we've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Not anything that we've done, all what Jesus has done. We, we can come straight into this throne of grace. We're adopted sons and daughters. We're, we're co-heirs with Christ. And then let us hold fast. Let us hold tightly to this promise of God's forgiveness, that we hold tightly to it. And the promise of eternal life that's found in Christ for those who give their life to him and submit to him that he gives us genuine hope. And then let us consider, let us think of ways. Let us, in this group, this is for us. Let us think of ways that we can encourage one another. And let us think of ways that we can continually meeting together. This is what he's saying. We, we think of ways that we can meet together, that we're gonna actually be the church to each other. What a sad thing for those who don't have this. <laughs> what a sad thing for those that don't have this. What a sad thing for those who cannot claim this in their own lives. May our anthem ring these truths. May this be the slogan, the mantra for which the anchor is known. That we are a community of believers who are truly involved in each other's lives and that we can truly claim the blood of Christ. Would you pray with me? Oh, dear Lord. You know if, if there are those in, in here who, who cannot claim these truths. You know, if the, you know who's sitting in here right now. You know if they cannot claim these truths for themselves. They cannot draw near to you because they have not submitted to you. They have yet to hold tightly to their hope in Christ. Lord, would you draw them to you by your spirit? We know that no one can come to Jesus unless the Father draw him. So, Father, we are asking on behalf of those in here who don't know you, who can't claim this, we ask, we implore them to be reconciled to God today. There are those here who just play church. They just play church. And you're calling them. You're calling them to begin the process of truly being a community of believers. 
God, would you draw them to yourself to, to truly be the church? And today, oh Lord, would you just call people to yourself? Draw them to yourself into a committed relationship with you and a committed relationship with your body, which you call the church. Would you draw them to yourself? It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.